Okay, I suppose this is a sign that we're ready to start. The meeting is being recorded. So welcome to the first December meeting of the Comsoc video seminar. Uh, so as I said, so we had a little bit of a break because of Thanksgiving, because of end of term pressures, but we are happy to be back here. And our speakers for today are Marcus Brill and Robert Bredere. So the first people on the first four people on my screen, so Robert, Marcus, Dominic, who is co-hosting, and myself, at some point we're all based on the same floor of the same building on in Oxford on Parks Road. Right. And Robert and Marcus after that were based in the same building for a while, but I think no longer. So they're both in Berlin, but Marcus Marcus is in TU Berlin and Robert is in Humboldt University. So Marcus is going to go first. Marcus will would you like to share your screen? I'm um, sure. Does it work? Uh, yeah, looks good to me. Right. Okay, so Marcos will be talking about his joint work with a number of colleagues from Madrid, Luis Sanchez Fernandez, Norberto Fernandez, and Jesus Fisteus. Right, and this is the work about extending don't matter to approval based multi winner election. So welcome to Marcus. As usual, we have a 20 minute talk, 10 minutes questions, with possibly the boundary between 20 minutes talk and 10 minutes questions somewhat blurred. Right, you are welcome to ask questions or leave comments in the chat during Marcus's talk, and he'll pick them up after the talk. You can also, also once the talk is over, you can ask questions by raising your hand or somehow otherwise indicating that you have a question you want to ask. Okay, Marcus, you can start now. Okay, um, thanks Edith. Uh, I just checked and actually Luis, uh, one of my co-authors is, is also there, so he can, might also have an eye on the chat uh, while we go along. And I'll just make sure to open the chat window so that you can give me uh, signals. All right, so um, Edith, thanks for the invitation. Um, I think this is a great initiative, this Comsoc video seminar. Um, I think by now we all kind of used to it, uh, but I think it's, it's great and something worth, worth keeping for the long term. Um, I'm talking about, as Edith explained, a, a paper that extends the DONT method of apportionment to uh, what people call ABC voting, approval based committee voting. And the method we propose is called the maximum support method. And Edith has already also mentioned my co-authors, uh, Luis, Norberto, and Jesus. So the point of departure of our paper is apportionment, which is a setting that most of you will be familiar with uh, when you vote, for example, for uh, uh, parliament and European elections, which we did not too long ago, I think, maybe, maybe last year or so, uh, I forget. Uh, and then every, every voter can vote for a party, and then based on how many votes a party got, the number of seats the party gets in the parliament is determined. Uh, this is of course very well studied. I'm pretty sure you know at least one of those books. And I'm also sure that most people have heard about the DONT method, which is uh, also called the Jefferson method in the US. And it's actually used to the majority of uh, EU states uh, in the European elections. Uh, the twist that we're adding here to get into the ABC voting setting is uh, that we use approval ballots. So also that I think should be more or less well known. And by allowing voters to express their preferences via such approval ballots, where you can vote for more than one candidate, actually as many as you like, uh, we get uh, two, uh, two nice advantages. First one is that this is just more expressive, right? because you can, uh, if you're still in a party list setting, you can pick and choose candidates across different party lists, for example. And the second advantage is maybe is even, even more important is that you can use this uh, also for settings where there are no parties. So there is no way to easily categorize parties into, into groups, uh, uh, candidates in, into predefined groups. Yeah, so this is the so-called ABC setting. ABC is for approval-based committee voting, where we have as an input uh, for every voter an approval vote over candidates. And as an output, we want to have a winning set of candidates of a given size. Now, this might sound very abstract, but uh, those of you who are members of the Social Choice and Welfare Society should have received an email earlier this week by Vincent uh, reminding you to vote. And the voting method they use there, or let's, let's first talk about the ballot. The balloting method is exactly the one I'm talking about. So there's a list of candidates. 
uh, you can approve as many of them as you like. There's no bound on how many candidates you, you approve. And fun fact, uh, three of the candidates in this list are previous speakers of the seminar, so I will use them later on as candidates in my example elections. So a little bit more formally, uh, what we're talking about is uh, we have final set of candidates, final set of voters. Every voter I gives us a subset of approved candidates, which is denoted by AI. And then given such a preference profile, which lists this approval set for every voter, uh, and a number K, which is the number of seats or the number of members of the committee that we want to elect, we are then tasked with finding a subset of the candidates of exactly that size. Okay, and they have, as you're probably aware of, there have been lots of work in, in ComSoc in recent years in comparing different methods and their properties. All right, what's maybe not super familiar is the graph representation I will use, but it's very natural. So uh, we can easily depict uh, approval preference profiles by a bipartite graph where on the one hand side we have the candidates, on the other hand we have voters, and we just have voters pointing to the candidates they approve. Right? And the way to read this is that there's like 100 voters that approve uh, both Edith and Chauffeur Soir, there's 60 voters approving um, Chauffeur Soir and Ramsey, and so on. Okay, so this is just a, a nice tool to, to think about preference profiles. And in this representation, it is very easy to think about uh, what apportionment as a special case means, where the apportionment case is the case where candidates come kind of pre-packaged into these party lists, and then a voter has only the choice to vote for, vote for one party list, which means that it proves all of the candidates within that party and, and nothing else. Right? And uh, so, so this apportionment setting here on the right-hand side is what, uh, uh, what, what is well studied, even more well studied than the ABC voting setting. This is where the don't method lives. And what we're going to do is we're going to define one way to extend the don't method from this apportionment setting to this more general ABC voting set. So the outline for my talk is as follows. So first I'll give you a quick recap of the don't method in case you haven't seen it or if you forgot. Um, I will describe it in terms of support and then as a next step I will generalize this notion of support uh, to the ABC setting. And based on this generalized notion, uh, our maximum support method or MMS will then be defined. I'll quickly go through some of the axiomatic properties of the method. And uh, in the end, I'll talk about the relation to Fragmain's rules, because if you thought I could give a talk about approval-based multi-winner voting without mentioning Fragmain, you would be wrong. Uh, and so uh, here we are. Okay, um, DONT is um, probably familiar, the DONT or Jefferson. It's a divisive method with this particular easy divisive sequence. If you don't know what it means, don't worry. Here's an easy explanation. So here is, um, uh, here is an example. Uh, the input of the voting problem is basically these, these first two rows or more precisely the second row. So in this example, we have three parties, P1, P2, and P3, uh, which receive the vote totals uh, that, that are written down here. And based on that, we need to divide a number of seats. Um, the way you do this is to const you construct this table, as I've already done here. And the way this table works is that each column, let's look at the first column for the first party, is you write down the number of votes for that party divided by one, then divided by two, then divided by three, then divided by four, and so on. And you go uh, until you have uh, enough rows, whatever it means. Okay, so this is how you construct this table. And then what the dot method does is basically it just picks the k largest numbers from, from, uh, from this table, from this lower part of the table that I've defined. Okay, so let's do this here. And let's say uh, k is equal to five, for example. So we just have to do this five times. So the largest number in this table is uh, this 5,100. Uh, so we pick that. Then the next highest is this one here. Uh, and, and the way to, what's going on is that whenever we pick um, a number that's in the column for party, that party gets assigned a seat. Right? So at, at this stage, I have assigned one seat to party one and one seat to party two. And then the third seat goes to party one again, because this number is, is bigger than this number, for example, um, and so on and so on. And then after five uh, rounds, we are left with this. And uh, by our interpretation, this means that uh, party one gets three seats and parties two and three get one seat each. Okay. So uh, even though it might, might seem a little bit arbitrary if you see this for the first time, what's going on here and one way to characterize uh, the don't method is that by doing it in this way, what you do is you maximize the support of the least supported elected candidate. So what do I mean by that? 
Well, look again at our example, right? The first party gets three seats. It has a, a voter support of 5,100. If we divide this support uniformly among the three seats, then each seat is, is supported by 1,700 voters, right? Likewise, the, this uh, single candidate of, of party two is uh, supported by 3,150 voters and so on. Okay, and because we, we, we pick the highest numbers in this table, we are maximizing the support of the of the candidate that is supported uh, in 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 in, in a, the, the least. Okay, because for example, uh, uh, think about what what happened if we had given the second seat to the second party instead of giving the third seat to the first party. Well, then the, the two voters, uh, sorry, the two candidates of the of the first party would have been supported only by this number, which is smaller than this number. Okay, so this is basically the very natural notion of support that we're now going to generalize to um, approval-based committee voting. So here's how we're going to do that. So this is probably the most uh, technical slide, even so you won't, you won't see any formulas, just to maybe try to follow. So the, the objects that we introduce are so-called support distributions. Um, just look at the example here. So this is one particular preference profile. This is the graph representation of it. So we have three candidates. Now, if you talk about support distributions, we need to fix a subset of candidates, let's call it capital D. So in this example, for example, we could choose A and C. So we only care about these two candidates and not so much about B. And now we're looking at different ways how those voters can distribute their support to those two candidates A and C, with of course the understanding that you can only support a candidate that you approve of, so somebody that's in your approval set which means that those 100 voters who approve both A and B, since B is not in the set C here, um, uh, it's not in the set uh, capital D here, uh, they don't really have a choice. So all of them will end up, uh, will end up supporting A. Um, these 40 uh, B voters, they don't really care uh, because they only, they only support a candidate that's not in the, in the relevant set. Uh, the support of those 50 C voters will go to C. The only group that actually has a choice are these uh, 60 AC voters and they can split up um, arbitrarily. We don't say everything would be a valid support distribution. Okay, so here's one example to do this. And then you can sum up basically the, I mean, this is kind of a network flow problem, right? You can sum up the, the incoming flow um, for each of the candidates in our set capital D. And in this example, uh, for this particular uh, split of, uh, of the 60 AC voters, we would end up with this support, which is of course not very nice, intuitively not very balanced, right? So this is why what we actually uh, want to look at is specific support uh, distributions, namely those that maximize the support of the least supported candidate in the set D, right? And in this example, of course, there's better ways of doing that. So for example, if they uh, use a different split here, um, then both A and C get uh, actually the same support, which is, which is of course always optimal, but in general, we want to divide, divide the support in such a way that, um, uh, that the least supported candidate has as much support as is, as is possible. Okay, so I hope this is more or less clear because this is basically the notion that we are, uh, that we're dealing with here. Uh, just one piece of notation is that uh, for any such subset D as the one uh, in the example uh, consisting of AC, we call maximin of D exactly this number that I've just explained, namely the, the number, the maximum value, so to say, so the, the support of the least supported um, candidate in, in an optimal support distribution. So and in general, what we want to, to find with our method are, um, are committees that have a high maximum value. Because intuitively what this means is that we have a committee such that we can assign voters to candidates in such a way that um, every candidate has, has lots of supporters. So this is a little bit of the uh, little bit of the style of the Chamberlain Courant and Monroe rules, where we assign voters to candidates, and we want to do it in such a way that um, that uh, the candidates that we end up selecting are reasonably well supported. And the way we measure it is by is the is the minimum support, and we want to make the minimum support as high as possible. Okay, so this leads us to our method, which we call the maximum support method. It's a greedy method, and uh, we chose to uh, define a greedy method for two reasons. Uh, first is computational, uh, computational reasons. Uh, it turns out that you want, if you want to globalize, uh, if you want to 
optimized this globally. This is uh, this MP hard. Uh, so this uh, will be trackable. And the other reason is that if you pick candidates sequentially, then you get a property called committee monotonicity or house monotonicity for, for free. Right. So this is, uh, these are basically the two reasons. So here's the method. So how does this work? We start with W, which will eventually be the winner set. We start with an empty W, and then we repeat K times, and each step will be add one candidate. And how do we choose which candidate to add? Well, for each candidate that remains, so for each candidate that's not yet included in the winner set, we compute what would be the maximum value for the set the consisting of W and this candidate. So it's kind of a thought experiment. We, we think about what would happen if we pick this candidate C, which is not yet in the set, we add it to the set, how well can we distribute the supports in, the, uh, in, this, in this set uh, W union C, and we want to pick the candidate that maximizes this maximum value. Yeah, so this is what's written here. So C star is the candidate maximizing this, and this C star is then added, okay? So there's also an alternative characterization in the paper. Uh, but uh, for now, uh, to, just to keep things simple, let's uh, let's stick with this uh, with this um, characterization. So, in order to uh, illustrate this, let's go through one example. And one thing I forgot to mention is that this uh, maximum value for a given subset can be computed with a linear program. So, what that means is that in each step, you need to solve a couple of linear programs. Okay, so it's still polynomial time, but it's not very cheap uh, computationally because you need to solve lots of them. Okay, here's the example, and here I smuggled in another dummy candidate just to make things uh, more, more interesting. And let's look at the following preference profiles. So now, I know you should be familiar with how to read them, right? There's 20 voters, uh, approving candidates E and B, and so on. So what do we do for the maximum method, maximum support method? Um, well, we start with the empty set, and in the first step, we compare all the singleton sets. So basically what we have to do is we have to compute the maximum value for the set consisting only of E, only of B, only of L, and only of S. And uh, maybe if I manage to see the chat, we can try to get some game going here. So, um, uh, so what is, what, which set has the highest maximum value uh, out of those four sets and how high is that value? I see there's some discussions already going on in the chat that I, of course, did not follow at all. But maybe still somebody wants to. Yes, so there's, okay, there's a couple of correct solutions, so now they're coming in. So candidate E uh, is, the, is, is, the, is, the, is the winning alternative in this case, has the highest maximum value, uh, and, the, and the value is 33, uh, sorry, 32. And uh, the reason that uh, this, this works is that for singleton sets, the maximum value is nothing else than the approval score, right? Because if you only want to support a single candidate, the only thing that makes sense or the only thing that's possible really is that all voters who approve that candidate uh, channel all their support to that candidate. So the first one will always uh, coincide with approval voting. And that means that we will add candidate E in our example to the winning set. And in the next step, now we will compare these sets, which are, which are um, the sets that consist of E and one of the remaining candidates, right? So this is what we now have to compare. And um, now what we have to do, we have to compute the maximum value for these three sets and find the one which has the highest value. And again, we can use the chat for uh, uh, having tips. Um, uh, just remember that the candidate E, even though it's already selected, also needs to still to be supported because it goes into the, the maximum evaluation. So we want to find the distribution among E and whoever is the second candidate such that the minimum support of that, uh, the minimum support among those two candidates is as big as possible. Okay, and I see a couple of different solutions this time, which is great. And I also see uh, a couple of right solutions. Uh, and uh, indeed, uh, if we pick uh, L as the next candidate, then we can construct a, something uh, that has a maximum value of 21, and this is, uh, is the highest in this case. Okay, and then as a final step, uh, we have, so we have E and L in the committee, and we, we compare the, the final two candidates, uh, which one gives a higher maximum value, just to make it a little bit shorter now. Turns out that um, um, this is S now because this is now the, the maximum solution, right? So this is also a case where you see that they don't have all uh, have the same support, but the maximum value for this one is the best 
because if we had picked candidate B, then we would have to divide all of those voters among the three, and this would be would be worse. Okay, so the winning set according to AMS, as it, as it should be, I should say, for these candidates uh, is, is ELS. And uh, now uh, let's let's go on and let's quickly talk about the properties that this, uh, that this uh, method satisfies. So for comparison, I've listed here the properties that don't satisfy. And in fact, you can go through this list of properties and see that MMS uh, satisfies um, appropriate generalizations, I would say, of those properties. So for example, it satisfies PGR, even priceability, uh, but not EGR. It satisfies house monotonicity by definition, and it, proper, uh, and it satisfies a, an, at least a weak version of population monotonicity. And as I've already mentioned, it's also efficiently computable, uh, not very cheap because you have to solve a, a number of LPs that is, that is, that is not, not very small. Okay, and now if you are a, a researcher in ABC voting and you look at these properties and it's like, ah, it's very interesting. It's very similar to Fragmen, actually. Sequential Fragmen has exactly the same uh, uh, axiomatic performance, if you will. Uh, this is not the only reason, but this is one of the reasons why we then started to think about uh, Fragmen. And uh, I don't have time to, 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 um, to define it here, uh, just maybe show you to, to remind you, to, at least to remind those of you who have heard about it. It's this weird method which can be uh, uh, done with the wine glasses and, and, and the wine bottles, where the voters are the glasses and the candidates are the bottles, and you choose the bottle and uh, distribute it among the voters that, that approve this candidate. And they do this iteratively at each step, trying to make the, 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 the wine glass uh, not, not rise that, that high. And if you think about it, it already sounds a little bit similar to what, what Maximin support is doing, right? Because here we have candidates and we distribute them among voters. On the other hand, for the Maximin support, we have voter support that we distribute among candidates. So it sounds a little bit dual to each other and, and turns out that this intuition is right. So there is a close connection between support distribution that we talked about and the load distribution at, as they are used in Fragmain's rule. And uh, doing that uh, or using this connection, uh, MMS can also be interpreted as a load balancing rule, basically as a variant of Fragmain. The difference, uh, uh, just very briefly, the difference to uh, what uh, sequential Fragmain does is that in MMS, in each step, you are allowed to redistribute previously assigned loads. So basically you can take some wine out of a class and put it into some other class, which is not in order to get a better better load balancing, this is something which is not allowed under under sequential fragment. There, whenever you assign a liquid, then it's basically frozen and never goes out of the class. Okay, and this this means that uh, uh, well, it's it's very similar, but it's different. Uh, there are examples where they also produce different results. Uh, another very interesting uh, connection is that if you look at the global optimization problem of optimal maximum support, this turns out to be exactly the same as the optimal fragment, so the optimal uh, load distribution. Okay, um, I just saw the message. I should finish soon, so let me be a quick, bit quick here. Right, so this is interesting. This also proves that uh, that optimal maximum support is NP hard because this was known for for optimal fragment. But um, at some at some sense, since there is this close connection, we we were left with the question: Well, if it's so similar to to uh, to sequential fragment, what is the what is the advantage? Right? I mean, it's 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 different, but it's very similar uh, axiomatically. Uh, it's it's basically the same. Uh, computation is harder, is there also an advantage? And this is where things were kind of standing until a couple of months ago, and then something unexpected happened. Um, namely, we were actually contacted also by some researchers uh, that working for a blockchain foundation. So there's a thing called Polkadot, which is a blockchain network that was just launched this year. And apparently, so I don't know much, much about these things, but apparently it's a big deal. So it has been called by Bloomberg the Ethereum killer. So this is a, apparently a, a, a huge thing. And one of the innovations that they built this Polkadot on is called nominated proof of stake. So you might have heard about proof of work and proof of stake as different consensus protocols for, for blockchains. Uh, what they use here is um, a protocol that uh, basically is an election where the community elects a committee of validators who then participate in the consensus protocol of the, block, of the protocol of the, of the blockchain. Okay, um, so, but, What's relevant for, for us is that this, this NPOS basically runs an ABC election. These nominations are the approvals, and then these validators make up the committee. And uh, this led uh, people from the foundation that's behind this Polkadot 
uh, to actually look at ABC rules. And uh, they, write, they wrote this very interesting paper, which has uh, lots of interesting stuff in it. Uh, one thing that I go quickly over is that they interpret, so they get interested in maximum support method because they interpret the maximum support objective as related to the security of the blockchain because it avoids over-representation and therefore makes it harder for attackers to gain control over, over uh, validators. And more interestingly, or more relevant for our paper at least, uh, they also showed a very nice theorem, namely that MMS, our method, provides a true approximation for the maximum support problem. And especially in combination with the, net, with the next part of the theorem, this makes sense because sequential fragment they show does not offer any constant factor approximation. And so basically what they gave us with a completely different motivation, what they gave us is, 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 is exactly what we needed, namely a reason in, 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 uh, or in, uh, in a dimension along which MMS is doing better, in this case even arbitrarily better than sequential fragment because this maximum support objective, which is very relevant for them, uh, it is uh, approximated by MMS, but by, not by sequential fragment. Okay, so this was a very nice turn of events and very, very interesting to learn about this stuff. So let me conclude and say that, uh, well, remind you that we have introduced this MMS method as a generalization of DOMT, uh, axiomatically similar to, uh, to fragment, also, also uh, procedurally very similar to sequential fragment, but as we've just seen, is better approximation of the, of the optimal maximum support. Um, another thing that was pointed out in this paper by Javalius and Stewart that I just mentioned is that uh, the MMS objective or the maximum support objective can be interpreted as avoiding over-representation because you want to make sure that every uh, elected candidate is supported by, uh, by a large group. And this is very, very different to what we usually do in ABC voting, where we talk, when we talk about proportionality, we always talk about uh, we want to avoid under-representation, right? We always want to make sure that if there is a certain group, a cohesive group, say, they need to be represented. This is where all this JR, PJR, EJR business goes, goes into. And so, and then it can be argued, and as also done by, by those two guys, is that MMS is one of those methods which strikes a nice balance between this overrepresentation, just by definition, because it's, it's looking at, it's uh, approximating this maximum support, and underrepresentation because it satisfies uh, PGR, this proportionality notion. Okay, and I think that's basically it. So, the, the main conclusion is, of course, that uh, Fragment goes blockchain. And the very last thing uh, I want to say is that uh, I currently have an open postdoc position. So if you want to work on blockchain or Fragment or anything else, uh, please get in touch and have a look at this website. Thank you very much. Okay, thanks, Markus. I propose that we unmute our microphones now and uh, for a round of applause. Okay, very good. Uh, feel free to mute the microphones back. So now we have a healthy selection of questions in the chat, something like five or six. So Marcos, I suggest. Uh, so the first one of them, I think, was partial, at least answered by Lois. Uh, so Rita asked about reverse sequential MMS, if you will. Ah, interesting. Um, Lois has answered. Right. Lois has answered, and I don't think I have much to add to that. Yeah, I mean, it, it, in general, some of these algorithms also um, have a reverse variant, and sometimes they have uh, interesting properties that the forward variants do not have. Um, but yeah, in this particular context, I don't think we have really looked at it. But yes, yeah, since the computational cost is already very high for such a sequential method, uh, doing it reverse sequential, especially if you have lots of candidates, which is probably also what happens in, this, um, in these blockchain applications, this would probably be infeasible computationally, but uh, axiomatically, so certainly something to look at. Right, and I believe so. Sorry for interrupting, but I think so. For for fragment, we know that reverse sequential fragment is different from sequential fragment. Um, yes, I mean it's it's certainly a different method. Also, I'm not aware of uh, of uh, axiomatic results on on that uh, reverse version. Mm -hmm. But there are reasons to believe they're different. Okay, mm -hmm. other questions in the chat? Okay, uh, so Rita also asked whether there is a full axiomatic characterization. We do not have that. Um, 
Uh, as, uh, and and you can already see why why we would not have that because all the axioms that we talked about are also also um, uh, satisfied by by fact being. So in general, there's not too much known about uh, characterizations. Okay, then uh, Nisag is asking if you look at the fact main objective, is the opposite result where sequential fragment gives a constant? I see. Um, uh, no, it's not because uh, as as, as you can see here in the second point, um, the, I should use this point, I guess, um, maximin support. So the, the, the optimal objective of, of maximin and fragment is actually the same. This is what's kind of surprising. And so that means that for, uh, for optimal fragment, uh, so if you look at uh, approximating the perfect load distribution or the optimal one, um, also MMS does better. So this, this uh, approximation also, also holds uh, for, uh, for, the, for the fragment formulation. So MMS. I see. So uh, is it that the, the uh, objectives uh, themselves are the same or is it that uh, optimizing the, the global uh, maximum objective uh, leads to the same outcome as the, op uh, the one that, that we get by optimizing the global fragment objective? Right. Um, I uh, okay, I, I would need to think a little bit more. I think it's even, it's even exactly the same because you can, okay. whenever you have a load distribution, you can, you can uh, 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 turn it into a, a support distribution and vice versa. So it's actually right, the same, an approximate same load problem. distribution and an approximate support distribution may not be convertible to each other, right? So yeah, that's so that's. I think that requires some thought, but I think I went yeah. through that, and I think I can confirm that the the approximation also works uh, for the fragment objective. But it's a good question. Awesome. Yeah, awesome. Okay, then we have Rupert. I'm not sure whether I should even read this. Does the approximation to the maximum support objective imply? Oh, okay, it's the same question. Okay, it's actually a good question. So well done. Uh, um, okay, and then we have Paul. Hi, Paul. Uh, how do MMS fragment winner sets compare to mini max? Oh, now there's people writing, so it goes away. Oh, how does it compare to mini max uh, of uh, Brahms, Kilgore, Sanva? Uh, right, it's very different. Uh, it's very different for the reason that, uh, or that it was, oh, I think I switched the questions up, right? Right, you're answering Rob's question now, so let's first... Okay, I'm, I'm answering, Lo sorry, Paul, uh, I'm answering Rob's question, uh, which is how does MMS and Fragment compare to uh, the Minimax method? Uh, and, the, and the answer is it's very different because the Minimax method does not satisfy even very weak proportionality axioms. So it does not satisfy even something weaker than, than PGR. So in, in general, it produces to uh, it produces committees that are that are not uh, very proportional, and in that, that respect, they they can they can give very different uh, results. Okay, coming back to Paul, doesn't efficiency of the method not also depend on the growth of the size of the LPs that need to be solved? Um, Right. I mean, I guess that's that's there. I mean, I'm I was closing over this fact, so I'm just saying it's polynomial time because it's a polynomial time, polynomial time number of LPs with uh, of polynomial size. Uh, but yes, of course, if it if it gets bigger, uh, if you have many candidates, then you uh, then you also have many many of those to check, uh, and and also of course the the constraints. Uh, so yeah, so it, it grows and and in fact, so just a little aside on the blockchain stuff, they they end, they end up using not they end up not using MMS spec, uh, specifically for that reason because it's too slow. So they come up with something between MMS and Fragment, which is a little bit faster than MMS, but therefore sacrifices a little bit of the approximation factor of the of the optimal um, solution. Okay, then we have Vince. Uh, hi, Vince. If the Goal is to approximate maximum support. We could presumably do better, at least in practice. Right, right. Yeah, that's that's a good point. Right. So what you're saying is that we, since we're doing this sequentially, why don't we just do like two at a time or so? And uh, yes, we can certainly do that. Right. It would probably not be so principled anymore. I think uh, one property that you might want to think about is how spontaneity, right? So you would need to think about if we add two at a time, but if I'm asking exactly like to add one of the two, which one you want to add first and so on, could probably be fixed uh, and could probably be better. And in some sense, I mean, I'm very hand waving here, in some sense, something along that lines is done by the authors of this uh, paper that I mentioned to, to come up with a variant. 
Okay, uh, then. I think that's answered from okay. the Right, so now Great. I'm using my position as a chair. Uh, let me ask a question and then maybe give a chance to some others to ask questions. Uh, so is there any reason to believe that you can't do better than a factor two approximation? Is there like an obvious hardness reduction from something that is not better than two approximable like vertex cover? Um, it's a good question for sure. Um, and maybe Lewis can help me out, but uh, I think it's a value that Stuart talk about in their paper. So because they show not only that uh, the optimal version is, is, is hard to compute, but also hard to approximate. Uh, I think they, okay, so, we, so now I remember they, they, they show that, um, well, they say that their approximation ratio of two is not tight, so it could be improved. I think there is something that, uh, there's certain uh, approximation factor that you cannot do in polynomial time, that's already known, but it could be better in, than two, so there's, there's room for improvement. Thanks. Okay, if anyone else wants to ask a really quick <clears throat> question. So Louis says his conjecture is uh, four thirds for the optimal third, approximation. Nice Okay, any further questions, but they have to be quick because we are already more, it's more than half an hour since the start of Marcus's talk. No? Okay, so let's unmute ourselves for another round of applause. Okay, before we go into the break, uh, we are more people today than usual, and I'm curious why. Um, so I made a poll, it's anonymous. Um. I'm talking is not an option. No, the penultimate option. It's just coincidental. Uh, I don't know how to answer because it's just our professor recently recommend our this seminar. Oh, <laughs> uh, begging. So viral marketing. <laughs> Second search. <laughs> okay, I, I will choose the third. All right. So it's mostly today's speakers who are very attractive.